If you guys could open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to be picking up where we left off last week. Uh, just a little bit of review to begin. I want to remind you guys, uh, Tucker used a phrase last week, uh, the hall of faith. It's a phrase that's commonly used uh, to kind of describe and explain Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 gives a list of different uh, men and women of the faith throughout history who have been an example to us of what it is like to have faith in God. But it's really important that as we go through it and as we reflect on the lives of these great saints of old, that we don't forget that essentially this chapter has one basic theme, one basic point. Obviously, the theme is faith, but it's making a point about faith. And, and it's really important that we get this point down because you guys need to understand that as Christians, especially I think as Protestant Christians, if you're familiar with the history of the church, the Protestant Reformation, 1517, Martin Luther, the great German monk, posted 95 theses to the door of the church at Wittenberg, statements that, that called for reformation in the church. He began a movement, and in this movement, Christians began to affirm that we are saved fundamentally by grace through faith, not by works, which is, of course, something explicitly taught in Scripture. But it's really important that we understand faith because the word has lots of different meanings and there are lots of different ways we can take it. And, of course, the Scriptures tell us that, that it's not always clear when somebody uses the word faith and when somebody tells somebody that all they need to do is believe in Jesus. It's not always clear what that means. Uh, James, of course, in James chapter 2, rebukes uh, people who think that simply believing that there is one God is sufficient for salvation. For that is clearly not the case, as he points out, that even the devil believe, or the demons believe and tremble. So, so it's very important that as we read this chapter, we understand that he's, the author is trying to point out what faith is and what it actually means to walk in faith and to live by faith, and he gives us several examples to illustrate it. So I start off just with a reminder, I know this is review, but of the definition of faith that is given to us in verse one. Uh, I'm reading from the New King James, but the New King James actually, I think, gives a pretty poor translation of verse one. So I'm just going to substitute it with words that Tucker brought up from different translations. Verse one, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things unseen. That's the better reading. I just wanna remind you guys, his definition of faith is essentially rooted in two fundamental things. Number one, it's the assurance that things that we are hoping are going to materialize will materialize. Tucker talked extensively about that last week. I'm not going to rehash it. If you didn't hear the sermon, go back and, and listen to it. And then the second thing is the conviction of things not seen. This idea that the world exists of far more things than just what we can see with our eyes. That God who we cannot see is real. That angels and demons and principalities and powers and spiritual beings are real. And that there are forces at work in the world that are real, that are not material. And so, so there are two aspects to this, right? These two things are true of faith. If you have faith, you understand these things. And so we're gonna kind of get started. I want you guys to be thinking as we move forward, taking a look at the examples we're gonna be looking at today because we're gonna be looking at three fundamental examples. I want you to remember this definition and I also want you to remember ultimately the kind of question I started with, which is what is faith and, and why is it so crucial and so essential? Because my hope and prayer is that by the end of our study today, that will make itself somewhat clear. So let's take a look here at verse four. We look at the first of the heroes of faith that is mentioned. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. So he decides to go all the way back to the beginning, to the first person who was able to express a righteous act to the Lord, according to uh, the scriptures, according to the book of Genesis. Uh, not to say that his parents didn't do righteous acts, but just that the, there's this first time 
in the, in the scriptures where you have opposition between two people and one person is righteous and one person is wicked. You, of course, have Adam and Eve with the serpent in the previous chapter, but people living out in the world, the righteous one is Abel and the wicked one is Cain. And we take a look at Abel's first act of sacrifice. So he goes all the way to the beginning. Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 23 will actually comment on this and say, that all of the, he'll talk about all of the prophets throughout history, and he'll start with Abel, looking at Abel as the first of the righteous prophets. So here's the thing. I remember as a kid wondering, what was it about Abel's sacrifice that was righteous and good? What made it accepted? Because when you read the actual text, it's not obvious, right? Let's go ahead and take, head back to Genesis chapter four, and let's take a look at it. Genesis chapter four, we'll start in verse three. Taking a look here at the story of Cain and Abel, which no doubt you're all familiar with to some degree. Genesis four, verse three. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering uh, of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the first fruit, firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So I just want to pause and just look at that specifically. I mean, I remember reading that as a kid. I remember being taught the story, and I remember being terribly confused. Why was Abel's offering respected by the Lord? Why was it accepted? Why was Cain's rejected? And the interesting thing here is, is there is no point here in the text where we are told why. It's just God respected one, he didn't respect the other. And that's a, that's a troubling thing, it's a tricky thing. What, what could possibly be with that? Because I want you to remember, Cain is a tiller of the ground, he's a farmer. What kind of things, as a tiller of the ground, can you offer in sacrifice? You will offer the fruit of the ground because that's your work, that's your labor, that's what you have to offer. Abel, of course, is a rancher. He tends sheep, he's a shepherd. So, of course, the fruit of his labors is going to be of the flock. So it just seems that they're both just giving what they have. And at no point in the text of Genesis does it actually pause to try to tell us why this matters. It moves on into an entirely different uh, section of the story completely. So I wanna pause here. I wanna think about what the author of Hebrews is saying here. Let's go ahead and go back to Hebrews chapter 11. I'll have you be, you'll be flipping back and forth a little bit here today, I apologize. So look at it again. By faith, Abel offered God a more excellent sacrifice. So here the author of Hebrews points out that there is something fundamentally greater about what Abel did than about what Cain did. And fundamentally, that is rooted in the fact that Abel's offering came by faith. Cain's offering did not come by faith. I don't know exactly what that means entirely. I don't know Cable's mind. I wasn't in his mind. There's no exposition of it. But we do have a little bit of a hint into it later on, right? Because we can see by Cain's subsequent actions that there is something fundamentally wrong inside of him. Because as you guys know, Cain is going to wrestle with the fact that God respected Abel's offering and that he did not respect Cain's. And that is going to ultimately lead to murder. So at bare minimum, we at least know that there's something wrong with Cain on the inside. And we look at Abel and we can see that there's something fundamentally right with him on the inside. I'm not gonna go too much into this yet because I think there's a little bit of explaining that comes later. But I want you guys to recognize that what the author of Hebrews seems to see, what he seems to comment on, is that Abel had faith, Cain did not. And because of that, Abel is honored not only by God, but is honored in subsequent generations through all of human history. As this ends, it says, God testifies of Abel's gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. We still recognize that Abel was great, that Abel was a prophet, that Abel was faithful. Here we are, millennia later, 
and we still honor him. We still remember him. Uh, the term Cain is a byword in our language, in our culture, right? It's, Cain is not a good thing. Uh, the, the phrase, you guys have heard the phrase raising Cain. Uh, I've heard, uh, maybe you haven't. I've heard that phrase a few times. Uh, and I've heard it in different contexts. I actually don't exactly know what the proper way to use it is. I've heard people say raising Cain in the sense of raising children. And they're raising Cain means they're raising a bad kid. I've also heard it in the context of raising Cain, meaning uh, doing a whole bunch of bad stuff. Bottom line is raising Cain is not good, right? So here we are. Time has passed. Forgive me if your name is Cain. I don't. I don't, uh, <laughs> it has become somewhat of a more common name in recent history. That doesn't always work out that way. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is a byword. Uh, so he is not only dishonored by God there at the beginning, he is dishonored through all of time. And Abel is not only honored by God there at the beginning, he is honored through all of time. We'll carry on, verse five. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now I wanna pause here. Let's go back again, take a look at, now this time Genesis chapter five, and let's take a look at this Enoch. One of the things I want you to think about, Enoch in the 21st century for some reason has become an item of interest. Uh, even in the prayer room before service, somebody asked, uh, what are we, what, am I, what would I be talking about today? And I said, Abel, Cain, and Noah. And when I, or not Cain, Abel, Enoch, and Noah. And the moment I said Enoch, some people, woohoo. Uh, he's become an item of interest because of the internet, I think. Uh, because there is a book out there that is an ancient book, as far as we can tell from about the second century BC, it was certainly, forgive me if you think otherwise, certainly not written by Enoch, uh, but you can read it on the internet. It's actually been around. I mean, people could have accessed it throughout human history. It's just not readily available. But now that the internet's out there, anybody can click on it. In fact, I imagine a lot more people will be reading it today, perhaps. So I think there was some excitement because the book of Enoch says all sorts of other things about Enoch's life that the book of Genesis doesn't say. Uh, just so you guys know, not to disappoint, I will be saying nothing from that book or anything drawn from that book. So I, I'm sorry to disappoint. In fact, my point is somewhat the opposite. I want you to take a look here at verse, or at uh, uh, verse 18, no, sorry, 19. Uh, sorry, verse 21. I read, jumped up a little too early there. Enoch, this person I just mentioned, lived 65 years and he begot Methuselah, who's also somewhat well-known because Methuselah is, of course, the oldest person ever recorded in Scripture. He begot Methuselah. Now, here's what I want you to note. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, I want you to pause and think about this. It says two things about Enoch. Prior to the New Testament, there was nothing written about Enoch but these two things. And what are the two things it says? Or I should, it says a few things. It talks about him having kids. But I want to focus in on two aspects of his character. Number one, he walked with God 300 years. Number two, he walked with God and was not, for he took him, for God took him. Very simple very concise. What do we know about Enoch? We simply know this, that he walked with God. And because he walked with God, it says God took him. And the truth is, kind of like with Abel, I don't exactly know what that means. Right? People have all sorts of conjectures, all sorts of ideas. The reality is we don't exactly know what it means. He took him. Let me just say a couple of things that people conjecture. Well, first of all, actually, before I get into what he took it means, let's talk about what he walked with God means. I hope you note that is a metaphor, right? So that itself is even a little vague. What does it mean to walk with God? But it is a, it is a phrase we use a lot. And typically when we say that somebody walked with God, what we mean is that in some meaningful way, he had a relationship with God. 
in some practical way, he lived out God's desire for his life and he sought to obey God. That's essentially what we mean by it. Um, you could get down into more concrete, practical things, but he, he loved God, was obedient to God for 300 years, which is a long time. And then what does it say? He walked with God and was not, and then it says, for God took him. The implication of for God took him, I, I could be wrong on this, forgive me, sometimes I conjecture, we all conjecture. It almost seems like God taking him was a blessing or a reward. It was almost like God took him because he walked with him. That in the line of the genealogy of, Ab or of uh, uh, in the line of the genealogies of the sons of Adam, we have this one guy who has this weird thing that sets him apart in that he walked with God. It doesn't say that about anybody above him. It doesn't really say it about anything below him except for maybe Noah, but it doesn't use that exact phrase. Noah, of course, is righteous, of course, in his own right. Um, he walked with God. And because of that, he was not. Now, the main conjecture that most people take is that Enoch uh, was, because of his uh, righteousness, God took him straight up into heaven. And that's, kind, that's implied later on in the New Testament. You know, and so I think that that's the fair reading. But I think I want you guys to stop and consider it. Uh, he took him, at least in normal phraseology, the way we might speak in everyday life, could technically just mean that he like died, right? That God took him out of this world. God took him away. And if you read on, there's almost, and I've always had this, this understanding as I've read it. Now don't get me wrong, I do believe Enoch was, was taken away like, not just that he died, but I wanna make a comparison because I want you guys to, to understand something practically that I think maybe we don't quite get about this world. Enoch was alive as the world was speeding toward, toward an end. Enoch was alive as the flood was about to come. If he had not been taken out of this world, he would have lived through the destruction of the flood and would have died in the flood under God's judgment. Um, he lived at a time, which a little uh, later on here in the book of Genesis, uh, we will read that God saw that the thoughts and the intents of man's hearts were only evil continually. And so he lived in a time, not only in which judgment was impending, in which judgment was coming upon the world, but he lived in a time in which people were really, really bad, in which things were really, really bad. And in the midst of all of that, this Enoch walks with God. And as a blessing, he is taken. And the truth is, I think, I wanna be careful not to overstep bounds here, but we have a, I think an unfortunate, we have a very worldly view of death. In our mind, death is always bad. Uh, we will avoid it for ourselves at any cost. We will avoid it for our loved ones at any cost. We don't want it to imp kind of impinge upon our lives. But I hope you guys understand that the reality is, is that we do not know what the world holds for us in the future. We do not know what is coming down the pipe. Um, I think about the son of the king of Israel uh, that's mentioned uh, in the book of 1 Kings. He, uh, he falls sick and the king sends his wife to go talk to a prophet, to ask the prophet, is my son gonna get better? And his wife goes to the prophet and says, is my son going to recover from, from this illness that has taken him? And the prophet says to her, I have been sent to you with bad news, which is the kind of thing that I would have to imagine would make a mother's heart just drop. I've been sent to you with bad news. And then he goes on to say that because of her rebellious husband's life, because God had given him the kingdom, had taken it away from King Solomon and had given it to King Jeroboam, and he had rebelled against God, God was going to bring judgment upon Jeroboam's family. And he says, the truth is, all of your children are going to be killed. They're all going to die. They're all gonna be thrown into the fields and their bodies are gonna be eaten by wild animals. It's 
bad. Bad stuff is coming to you as judgment comes because of the wickedness of your family. So she went asking about this one son. Now she finds out horrible things are gonna happen to her, all of her kids. Terrible. But then he ends with a very weird statement. He says, however, that is not the way it's gonna be with the son that you're inquiring about, the young boy. He says, because God has found something righteous in him, I tell you the truth, he will die before you make it home. Sounds weird, but what he's saying is, of all your family, there's one who was actually righteous. There was one kid who was good. God found something in him, so God is going to take him there. And what is he doing by taking him there? He's sparing him from everything that is to come. You see, we just don't see what's coming in the world. We just don't know what's heading down the pipe. We think of certain things as, as unmitigated evils and we don't realize those evils are actually something that might be beneficial to us. So we have this man, Enoch. And who is Enoch? He's somebody who walked with God and because he walked with God, what did God do? He took him to spare him from everything that is to come. And let one last thing to think about with Enoch. As you reflect on him, very little is spoken, but what is said about him, very simply, he walked with God. And that is a testimony that he carries throughout all generations. So that here we are, 2024, and what are we still saying? Enoch walked with God. What an amazing thing for us, right? How great it would be if the testimony about Tom Velasco in 50 years, somebody talks about me after I'm dead. And what do they say about me? He walked with God. Is there anything else you really need? He walked with God. Enoch, we don't need all this speculation. We don't need the cool stories, although they're fun. Don't read it. Read it. It's fine. At the end of the day, what's the only thing we need to know about Enoch? He walked with God. And at the end of the day, what's the only thing we really need to have said about ourselves he walked with God, she walked with God. That's what's needed. And how did he do so? He did it by faith. He did it because he had assurance of hope that God had for him. And he had the conviction of the things that were unseen. He had the conviction of the reality of God. Let's go ahead and go back to Hebrews chapter 11. I'm gonna actually skip his commentary because we're gonna end with that. I'm gonna look at the third example he gives us, verse seven. By faith, Noah, the next guy in the genealogy, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. We're not gonna head back and look at more details of Noah's story for a couple of reasons. One, because of lack of time. Two, I think it's something, if there's anything you were familiar with in this list that I'm covering today, it'd be Noah, it'd be Noah's life. You guys all know that in light of what I just spoke about, this wickedness in the world, as God looked out at the world and he saw that the thoughts of men's hearts were only evil continually, he made a decision that he was going to send the floodwaters to wipe out life on the face of the planet but there was somebody who was found righteous in his generation, and that person that was found righteous was Noah. And what did he do? He decided to preserve Noah, to save Noah through it. And not only doing it because there was one person in his generation there besides Enoch who walked with God, not just doing that, but doing it also because he wanted to preserve uh, mankind. Through Noah, through Noah's lineage, mankind, would survive. And so, by faith, Noah, divinely warned of things not yet seen, he is moved by godly fear to build the ark to save the world. Not just his household, but it really is the world because the world can only survive because Noah does that. I want you to stop and think about this. The definition of faith again. It is the, uh, the conviction of things not seen. What is the thing that is not seen? God comes to Noah and says the, that I'm going to destroy the world with a flood. Waters are going to come and destroy everything and kill everybody. Um, 
That's not a thing that had happened before. It's not a thing that has happened since. It's not a thing that if you stop and rationally think about it, even makes sense. Yes, floods coming makes sense, but floods are small and they're local. They're not big, they're not, they can be a little catastrophic, but they're not the kind of thing that's gonna wipe out all mankind. But God comes and says, I'm gonna judge all mankind. This thing that is unseen. And now Noah has to make a choice. Do I believe it or don't I believe it? If I don't believe it, then what do I do? Then I carry on living life the way I always have. But if I do believe it, then what has to happen? I need to get to work building a big boat. You guys are procrastinators? I'm a procrastinator. Anybody who knows me knows I'm a terrible procrastinator. Um, what is procrastination? Procrastination fundamentally is an inability to look ahead. It's an inability to see what is coming down the road. Procrastination fundamentally is saying, I wanna do what is immediately convenient, immediately pleasurable, immediately fun. That's procrastination. What is Noah doing? He's told the world is gonna be destroyed. You can't be a procrastinator. You can't be a procrastinator because if he puts it off, what's gonna happen? He will not be able to build the boat. He will not be able to finish it in time. He will not be able to escape the judgment. Now, uh, people infer certain things from Genesis. I, I don't know how convinced I am of this, but we do read, there's this significant moment in Noah's life where it says he's 500 years old, and then we read that the floodwaters come when he's 600. Now, a lot of people infer from this, and I, this could be wrong, so it's not like definite truth, but a lot of people infer from this that when he was first told about the impending flood, that he had 100 years to build this boat. Now I want you to think about what that would be like during that 100 year period. Friends, neighbors, anybody who knows him, they come by and they say, what are you doing? And he says, oh, I'm building a boat. And they're like, why? And he's like, well, the world is going to be destroyed with water because of its rejection of God and because of its hatred of his precepts. And what would people think? People would think that's ridiculous. People would mock him, presumably. And we know that to some degree this is what he's doing because Peter points this out in 2 Peter 2, 5. When in Peter, you don't need to turn there, but in it, Peter calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. Now, I don't know exactly why he used that term and I don't know exactly what Noah preached. There's no statement about his actual sermons. But what stands to reason is, is if he was a preacher of righteousness, what is he doing? He's telling people that the world is gonna be destroyed. And what is everybody presumably doing? Well, I can say this, for sure they're not believing him. For sure they're rejecting his message. There are no other boats. Nobody else is getting prepared. Nobody else gets on with him. What else might they be doing? I would assume they're rejecting him in all the meaningful ways, mocking him, thinking that he's, you know, he loses his credibility in the community. He's the crazy man building the boat over there because he thinks the world is gonna be destroyed. But he's faithful, he's driven, he's building the boat, he's preaching the message, and he's doing it day by day by day, even when the floodwaters never seem to come. And that, I hope the application is clear. We have to do the same thing, right? The scripture, Jesus points out that in the final days, that is in the days before he, is, before he returns, it will be like the days of Noah. And here I'm going to contradict what some of you probably think as well. That is not talking about technological sophistication. It is not talking about events from the past that will be like it is today. What it's saying, and you can read on in the text in Matthew 23, what it's saying is that in the days when Christ returns, everybody will be carrying on with their life like they always have. He says people will be getting married, they will be giving their children in marriage, they're gonna be doing all the stuff of life. The day before the end of the world, somebody's getting married, and Jesus' point is, that's kind of silly, right? It's silly because why get married the day before the world ends? You don't go about, in other words, everyone's gonna be living life. So here's the thing, like Noah, what situation are you in? You have been told, judgment is coming. You have been told that there is going to be an end. You have been given a mission. You have been given a word to preach. You have been called to do things in this world and you don't know when it's coming. In order to move forward, you have to believe. You have to have faith. 
and you have to be able to walk in and preach that. And now the final thing. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, and this is kind of the key of it all. I'm backing up a little bit. After talking about Enoch and saying, for before he was taken, he had this testimony, he pleased God. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, that is, that God is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. If you're going to please him, those two things have to be true. And I wanna pause here and I wanna make a final couple of points with this. This is something that is disconcerting, I think, to people of the world. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Why would God care whether or not I believe he's real? Wouldn't he want to do what is good and right and kind and just regardless of what I think? Wouldn't he want to embrace me and love me regardless of whether I really believe him and understand him? Yes and no, I'll say to that. I think we can misunderstand this passage. Some people will even go so, go so far as to say, isn't it very mercenary of God to insist that you want, we want to please him? It almost makes God out to be a megalomaniac. He needs people to lavish praise and love upon him. Two things I want you to take away and, and think about. Why this line of reasoning I think is incorrect, why it's false. Number one, why we need to believe in God. Why we need to actually have faith in him. You see guys, you live in a culture and a society where somehow, for some reason, the idea of faith has itself become a virtue. Like it's virtuous just to believe things. People will say, have faith. Have faith, and that all they'll mean by it is that you should in fact have the affection, the emotion, the, the thing in your mind that we call faith. But faith in an object that cannot provide is bad. Do you understand? Like, if you're a parent and you want somebody to babysit your kids, you are exercising faith. Do you guys understand that? And you're exercising faith in the exact way that the author of Hebrews describes it. You're having confidence in things unseen. What do I mean by that? You're not home, you're not around. Somebody is sitting there with your kids. That person determines whether or not your children are safe. Also, you have an assurance of things hoped for. What's the hope? The idea that when you come home, your kids will be alive and okay mentally and have not been harmed. Do you guys understand that if you put your faith in the wrong person, those things will not happen? Do you understand that if you put your faith in the wrong person, your kids will be harmed? Your hopes will not be realized? It is vital that we know God and that we know the right God. Not just by name, not just the God of the right religion. I mean God in his character, in his person, that you know who he is, that you know what he thinks and, and how he interacts with the world. The God that is revealed in Jesus Christ, it is vital because if we do not put faith in him, then we're putting faith in something that can not give us the thing we hope for. It's not him being megalomaniacal. He's not being crazy and just, just wanting people to worship him because that's just the kind of guy he is. It's that he knows he is the only one that can actually meet your need. He's the one who can help you. And here's the second thing, and this is really vital. Do you guys understand that doing what is right is a very confused thing? Like, people can do what is right and it just can be really polluted and bad. And I wanna just briefly, and I know we're, we're running low on time, Briefly turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter six. Matthew chapter six. Look here at verse one. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. 
Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues, on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Here's the thing, guys, that I want you guys to understand. So much of what we do in this world that is right, that is good, is for all sorts of bad motivations. And that does matter. Like, a lot of people are like, well, as long as the good thing is done, that's the key. No, no, no. It matters what our motive is. We cannot be the kinds of people that God are calling us to be if we are being driven by all the things that make the devil what he was. If we are driven by pride and selfishness and vainglory, a desire for people to love us. And here's the thing, it's really hard to avoid those things. We learn it as children. When I was a kid and I was at Sunday school, my grandparents would give me money to put in the offering box. And what would I do? I would make sure to drop each coin slowly into the box so that everybody knew in the whole room how much I gave. Why? Because I wanted people to think, wow, he gave five quarters in the offering box, which was awesome as a kid. I could have used that elsewise. The reality is I did that to be seen by the rest of the kids. And here's the big thing that never occurred to me. It wasn't my money. It wasn't like my grandma said, take these quarters and you can either give them at church or go play them at the arcade. She said, here's your offering money. If I didn't give it an offering, that would have been bad, and if I got caught, I'd be in trouble. How you give matters. Why you give matters. Jesus says, do not be like the hypocrites who trumpet in the streets, meaning they let everybody know, hey, everybody, look at me. I'm about to give. Could you please build a plaque for me so that everybody knows how much money I've given? I want people to know what a great donor I am. Jesus says, if you want to be right, Give in such a way to where your right hand doesn't know what your left hand is doing. The point being, nobody knows. Because then you're not giving for vainglory. You're not giving for people to praise you. You're giving because you love God. And because God, who you can't see, you know him to be real. And you know him to be the one who, who rewards those who seek him diligently. That's the only way we can become the kinds of people he wants us to be. How do you pray? Jesus goes on to prayer. How do you pray? Do you pray in the same way in public as you do in private? Or do you in public pray long, very eloquent prayers and in private not pray at all? Do you understand that that says something about what you believe? It says something about either A, whether you believe God is real, or B, whether or not you think he cares. And so, faith. Faith is the kind of thing we have to have to please God. Not because he needs it, not because he cares, but because he wants us to become a certain kind of people. And it's not just prayer and giving, it's a million different things. It's the way you spend time with people. Do you do it because you love them? Do you do it because it's obligation? Do you do it because you love God? Do you, when I was driving here this morning, I was praying, God, let me, let it all go well. I want it to go well. I always want it to go well. I don't want to be up here and be bad. <laughs> and I, I prayed specifically. I said, God, for everybody else's sake, <laughs> I want them to grow and to be mature and be righteous. All those things are true. That is, it is not not true. But one thing I realized I was praying, I'm like, I don't care about that. Like I care about that it, it's good and that everybody likes it. Do you guys understand? Everything we do, what the author of Hebrews is saying is, have faith. Have faith in God. You cannot please him unless you believe he's real. He's right there. He's watching you at all times. Are you alone? Are you in private? Is nobody around to watch you? Are you gonna be the same kind of person there that you are in front of your children? 
Because if not, then what that is saying about you is that you don't believe he's right there watching or that you think he doesn't care. That's what being called to this life of faith is about.